for those of you who don't know him, this is Dr. Gong. He's one of our pediatric urologists here, and he's a specialist in minimally invasive surgery. Um, I'm, I'm actually very delighted to hear this talk and the role of partial nephrectomy in Wilms tumor. So um, I think if the residents have joined in, which I think they have, um, you can take it away anytime, Dr. Gong, and thanks for doing this. No, oh, no problem. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> first, thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, it, as many of the residents know, in general, for pediatric urology um, or for pediatrics, Wilms tumor is managed by the pediatric surgeons. And it's just kind of a dichotomy that's developed over the years. Um, at Lurie, one of the, the ways that I end up becoming involved is when a partial nephrectomy is necessary. And, you know, so because of that, obviously, I wanted to learn as much about partial nephrectomy as I, I, as I can. And it, it, it was kind of a fascinating area of management because obviously on the adult side for um, kidney tumors, if you can do a partial on it, you should try to do a partial on it. And the big discussion on the adult side is, well, why are people doing lap nephrectomies when they should probably do, be doing a partial instead? Right. <clears throat> so I started looking into kind of the use of partial nephrectomy for Wilms tumor. Um, we'll go over, you know, some background on Wilms and Wilms standard Wilms management. But then the meat of this is really going to be talking about kind of partial nephrectomy and perhaps a push for increased utilization. So Wilms tumor is also known as nephroblastoma. So the terms tend to get um, interchanged in the literature. Super common um, renal tumor of childhood. And it's an embryonal tumor, meaning that from the time the embryo is developing, there are immature remnants that will remain in the kidney that eventually turn into this nephroblastoma or Wilms. And the neat thing about Wilms is that from like decades ago, the management has been super well organized and concerted study efforts have been made by huge collaborations and it's made huge strides in terms of how it's taken care of. However, that also leads to big challenges in trying to change any sort of paradigm in management. So as we all recall, the metanephric blastema meets the ureteric bud and when that happens, branching occurs and then um, kidneys form. If there are any kind of remnants of that metanephric blastema, right, that remaining blastema is what eventually becomes Wilms tumor. And the common presentation for Wilms is either belly pain or frankly, belly distension, often asymmetric. A parent looks and says something's wrong. Right, and they feel, they can feel there's a big hard mass in the belly. Sometimes it's incidental. You get imaging because of something bad that happened and you're like, oh, geez, there's something worse happening on the inside. It can be associated with high blood pressure, gross hematuria. Um, but you can imagine that if you're palpating a mass in a kid, this tumor is already really, really big, right? <clears throat> um, when you see a kid with Potential wombs, you obviously have to look for associated syndromic features like aneuridia, hemihypertrophy, um, pedal abnormalities. If you see a varicocele or hepatomegaly, that implies that the wombs has climbed into the vena cava and is causing poor return of blood flow. It's jamming things up, similar to what you might see for a renal cell. So <clears throat> we said it's common. It's 95% of pediatric renal cancers and six to seven percent of all pediatric cancers. And in general, pediatric cancers aren't that common. So an incidence of like eight in, 100, eight in a million or around you know, one per 100,000 is really darn high. The classic age is three and a half, um, toddler age, 80% present before age five. But interestingly, as the Northwestern residents well know, Wilms, can definitely present later in life, but I think they had an adult presentation of Wilms just this past year, which can also happen. Now this next part is important, especially for nephron sparing surgery, but four to 13% bilateral tumors. Most Wilms, 
greater than like 85% of Wilms is sporadic, meaning that there is a genetic mutation, right? However, there wasn't a genetic predisposition. One to 2% is familial, which means that potentially something is, a gene is getting passed on through the family. But really the heart of where all of this management for um, partial nephrectomy or nephron sparing surgery for Wilms is really with the, those with associated genetic syndromes. So that accounts for a decent amount of them, 10 to 15%. You recall that four to 13% bilateral, a lot of them are in this group, right? The ones that the residents should all know about is WAGR, which literally four letters, Wilms, aniridia, GU abnormalities, and developmental and developmental delay. It's an R because it used to be retardation, which is obviously is a term that we do not typically use anymore. If you're going to remember one gene for Wilms, this is it, WT1 on 11P13. Dennis Drash syndrome is another one. That one is Wilms tumor with usually ambiguous genitalia or some pretty significant um, DSD. And these kids get renal failure from mesangial sclerosis. So they often have poor kidney function to begin with and often end up on dialysis, even if they don't get Wilms. This is also a WT1 gene problem. And then lastly, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, um, which is macroglossia, microsomia, like things are big when they are uh, in asymmetrically big. Um, and the tumors associated with this would be Wilms, rhabdomyosarcoma, and hepatoblastoma. This one is WT2. So these are the three that you should know for your boards. Now, when you look at these different syndromes, there is a different degree of risk for Wilms. For Wagner and Dennis Drash, you're looking at a 50% likelihood of Wilms. For Beckwith, Wiedemann, hemihypertrophy, um, familial Wilms even, right, you're, you're significantly lower, 5 to 10%, 30%. And then these other syndromes might be higher risk, but they're much less common, right? But there is a, a decent list of things that are associated with Wilms tumor. Um, <clears throat> and for these kids who are at risk for Wilms, we recommend screening. The standard interval is an ultrasound every three to four months. This goes through age seven, which puts you well past the peak um, age of presentation for Wilms. Now, the screening does provide a survival advantage. I don't know if it's necessarily a cost advantage, but it's definitely a survival advantage um, or a diagnosis advantage. Tumors are lower stage of diagnosis. Now, because we've done such a good job over the years treating Wilms, the survival might not necessarily be better, but it gives you better treatment options because you might not need radiation. You might not need as much chemotherapy. You might be able to do nephron sparing surgery. You can imagine if these are predisposed to bilateral Wilms and they're to the point where you have to remove both kidneys, well, you might have saved them, but you, you create a lot more problems. Now, there's a little bit of a controversy for when to screen. Clearly, if greater than 5% risk, you can screen, you should screen but many people think greater than 1% risk. I will say it's probably not cost-effective at greater than 1%, but there aren't a lot of parents who would necessarily be arguing that if they're diagnosed. Standard imaging is ultrasound, abdominal mass, skin ultrasound. A lot of times it's not Wilms, it's actually a big hydronephrotic kidney that's much less frequent now than in the past with prenatal screening. Um, kids should either get a contrast CT or an MRI after the uh, potential Wilms diagnosis on ultrasound. Three-dimensional imaging will give you a much better sense of what's around it, what kind of um, potential local invasion you see, and then frankly, what the blood vessels look like. Um, Wilms can have all sorts of funny things associated with it, calcifications, um, changes in fat density, you can see it invading into the drain, in, into the collecting system. Um, they can have vascular thrombi. Um, <clears throat> they can be cystic, they can be solid. It's a pretty heterogeneous kind of picture. Often we pair this with the CT chest of the chest because the lungs are the most common metastatic site. Staging is important. Um, stage one and two are low risk, typically completely limited to the kidney and 
no more residual tumor after excision. The difference between one and two is with two, it goes through the renal capsule, but it's completely excised. Stage three is when you start worrying about increased need of um, of radiation for local control. And obviously, if there's any residual tumor because of incomplete excision, peritoneal spillage from even before operating is a tumor potentially can rupture or tumor rupture during surgery, you're going to have a worse prognosis and in, well, you're going to need higher levels of treatment to, um, to cure. Stage four is metastasis, and stage five is bilateral involvement, because bilateral involvement is going to change how you manage things. Histology can be um, triphasic. <clears throat> Blastemal, stromal, epithelial kind of implies which part of that premature tissue um, developed the tumor. 90% will have favorable histology. And, sorry, is there a question? So 90% will have favorable histology, um, but there are kids who have anaplastic changes, which typically lends to poor outcomes. Um, <clears throat> the two most important prognostic factors for survival or treatment are tumor histology and stage. And this becomes important when we start looking at some of the data for partial nephrectomy. Oh. Yeah. So treatment could involve surgery. Almost, so treatment pretty much always involves surgery if you can. Um, chemotherapy and then radiation therapy for those um, who are grade stage three or four. The overall survival for Wilms, it, it probably is actually greater than 90% with multimodal therapy. And obviously this does kind of depend on stage of diagnosis. Um, the, in the United States, it's relatively high. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's actually lower than this, and a large part of it comes down to availability of healthcare. From a renal treatment risk standpoint, you can imagine if you're doing a radical nephrectomy, well, you've removed half the nephrons at the beginning. Now, those kidneys are often replaced with tumors, so a lot of those nephrons have already been lost. Um, chemotherapy obviously can have nephrotoxic effects and radiation therapy can lead to radiation and nephropathy. So all of these treatments we have for Wilms potentially can affect kidney function. And then again, this becomes important with the discussion for whether or not nephron sparing surgery has a role. Now, the thing I find fascinating about Wilms is just how well coordinated its management has been over the years. And the fact that surgeons and oncologists can get together and come up with these big treatment plans that get followed across countries is pretty impressive. The three big groups are the National Wilms Tumor Study Group, which is kind of folded into the Children's Oncology Group, which is last on this list. Um, I'm not going to butcher this in French, and I'm purely going to call it SIOP, which is a European branch in the United Kingdom. Similarly, with Brexit, separates from the United, from all of Europe, and they have their own um, UK children's cancer study group for Wilms. There's a major difference in how Wilms is managed between the groups. Nitwits and COG typically recommend surgery as the first line therapy, right? They want the histology, they want the staging before any sort of chemotherapy. And there's advantage to this because if it's anaplastic, for example, it's going to grow with chemotherapy. At least you got more of the tumor out up front, right? You have a better understanding of what's happening with the tumor. Um, now, the European at SIOP does chemotherapy first. The advantage to this is that when you give the chemo, and they do not do any biopsy, no guarantee that it's Wilms. The advantage to this is you can shrink tumors that decreases the risk of spillage during surgery, and spillage, right, bumps you from stage two to stage three, right? And because the tumors are smaller, surgery potentially is easier, right? The downside, though, is they treat up to 5% of kids who don't have Wilms. They have some other sort of pediatric tumor, right, pediatric renal tumor. In the UK, well, they kind of hedge their bets. They 
don't resect, but they do an upfront biopsy unless it's small and easy to resect. And then they, they're able to avoid chemotherapy for the tumors that are not Wilms, right? And potentially give more accurate chemotherapy um, for those for those cancers that are non Wilms. Um, but the problem is you upstage them because you did an open biopsy, right? So from a surgical standpoint, pretty similar cancer. Um, uh, pretty similar cancer goals as with any sort of radical nephrectomy. However, a couple differences. It's typically a transperitoneal approach. You have to explore the entire abdominal cavity, cavity for local extension and peritoneal seeding. Um, and obviously, with any cancer, you want to avoid tumor spillage and rupture. However, Wilms is a very friable tumor. It is easy to rupture Wilms. It's certainly easier than rupturing most renal cell carcinoma. The IVC in the renal vein should be palpated to make sure that nothing is extending into there. And there's a decent percentage with extension into the IVC. And then you should always do a lymph node sampling. You do not have to do a full template, RPLND, but you need at least seven lymph nodes, right? Standard recommendation. And these are the ones that are around the renal hilum. And then you march up and down the cava or the aorta, depending on the side. Now, neoadjuvant therapy given everywhere, uh, given to everyone in the PSYOP or European um, treatment. But in the United States, we do do neoadjuvant therapy if the tumor is thought to be inoperable. And often inoperable tumors are determined at the time of surgical exp exploration. Or if the tumor thrombus is above the level of the hepatic veins, you know you're not going to be able to get it all and ideally you can shrink it then, or if it's just a really big tumor invading surrounding organs, you can decrease the amount of overall damage that you do with your surgery. If there's disseminated disease, you already have METs, you're gonna use neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then bilateral Wilms tumor. Or Wilms in a solitary kidney that you're trying to save as many nephrons as possible. Um, standard chemotherapy has been Christine, um, dactinomycin, and doxorubicin. And then for stage three, you add radiation therapy. If there's diffuse spillage, you radiate the whole belly instead of just the flank, and you can radiate the lung if there are pulmonary meds. All right. So <clears throat> this is a case of a kid we operated on, four-year-old boy, hereditary spherocytosis. So these kids can get splenomegaly. And mom noticed that there is abdominal asymmetry, brought into the ER, <clears throat> and because she felt this big mass in his belly, CT scan was done. And you can see there is a very, can you guys see this pointer or no? Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So you can see there is a very large left-sided abdominal mass. It is not associated with the spleen. You can see here's the remnant of kidney here, gigantic tumor. But wait, there's actually three little lesions on the uh, three lesions on the other side as well. So this kid has bilateral Wilms. Recommendation is chemotherapy. They got six weeks of um, chemo. Repeated the CT scan, and this is what we see here. Good response. These tumors on the right side have shrunk nicely. The left-sided tumor has actually shrunk pretty nicely. You can see, though, it comes right up to the hilum, right up to the collecting system. Right. So the right side's obvious. Um, three wedge resections to get rid of these three little lesions. The left side, we ended up doing a hemi-nephrectomy, cut through the entire lower pole infundibulum, stented the kid through the infundibulum down to the bladder, and basically had nothing to close. So we left a raw surface and put like surgical seal and all sorts of stuff on it. Um, this is his post surgical imaging. He is still, um, he's like two years out now, still in remission. So bilateral Wilms, when you see it, chemo, like with this kid, um, you evaluate for the response to chemo. If it's a good response, then you go in there and operate. If it's a poor response to chemo, you biopsy the tumor because you're expecting anaplastic elements. 
And with those anaplastic elements, there's a different chemotherapy course that you would go through. Um, if it feels like it's amenable to partial nephrectomy, then you move forward with chemo. Then, then you move forward with partial. If not, it's 12 more weeks of chemo to see if you can get it even smaller. Standard approaches would be through a chevron transverse or midline incisions. Honestly, I've only done it through a big midline incision. And um, ideally, you do bilateral partial, partial nephrectomy. But depending on what's residual, you might do a unilateral radical and a contralateral partial, or sometimes bilateral radical, because at the end of the day, cancer control is number one for what we're doing here. Um, other indications for nephron sparing surgery besides bilateral tumors are tumors in a solitary kidney or kids who have a predis predisposition to tumor, like the Beckwith-Wiedemann, Wagger. Now, um, uh, Dennis Drash is not here for a very specific reason. Those kids often end up in renal failure. It's like an 80 plus percent likelihood of renal failure. If they have mesangial sclerosis, if they're already demonstrating evidence of renal failure, you're not going to save the contralateral kidney. So they often end up getting bilateral nephrectomies at the time of Wilms' diagnosis, right? <clears throat> um, if patients already have pre-existing renal insufficiency, you try to spare as many nephrons as you can, and those patients then would be um, potential um, candidates for nephron sparing sur surgery. If you have multifocal unilateral disease, implying that you're more likely to get more tumors in the future and re <clears throat> removing a whole kidney for three small lesions like that one we saw isn't the best choice. And then in general, if the tumor is in a really good anatomic location, well, maybe it'd be worthwhile doing, like a lower pole hemi might take care of this, even though it's a big tumor. And then you don't want any blastemal elements in that kidney because those blastemal elements, which we really didn't talk about, have the predisposition, have the propensity to turn into Wilms. So if we're going to do nephron sparing surgery, we have to prove a couple things, right? It has to be feasible, it has to be safe, right? We have to be able to achieve good cancer control. But at the end of the day, we also want to know that it's going to help preserve renal function because if it doesn't make a difference, then what's the point of going through something that potentially is higher risk? So when we look at safety or feasibility, um, one of the more recent studies to look at this, um, uh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> to look at this, um, single center, 99 patients, they matched 55 with nephron sparing surgery with 55 who had radical nephrectomies. Um, for the nephron sparing surgeries, the, major the large majority of them, 46, had bilateral disease, right? Um, nine had a solitary kidney. So you're looking at over 100, you're looking at um, close to 100 renal units that were ultimately operated on. Um, actually, over 100 renal units, 101 renal units that are operated on. Um, stage is greater for the the kids with a radical nephrectomy. So despite trying to match them, the majority of them were higher stage. Um, <clears throat> EBL was greater for nephron sparing surgery than for radical nephrectomy. Um, positive margins were greater for the nephron sparing surgery than radical nephrectomy. And when you look at complications within 30 days, there was about three times more for the nephron sparing surgery. Now, a lot of this makes sense. You're not going to get a urine leak with a radical nephrectomy, right? But prolonged urine leaks occurred in nine kids. Um, infections, both of the surgical site as well as urinary tract infections in eight, transient renal insufficiency and in intussusception in three, compared to four infections, three intussussceptions on the radical nephrectomy side. However, all of these complications were successfully managed. And keep in mind, you operate in one kidney for the radical nephrectomies. And for the nephron sparing, it was a total of 101 kidneys. So twice the number of kidneys were being operated on for the nephron sparing surgery, which potentially can account for some of these complications as well. <clears throat> 
Um, one of my friends, actually, John Ruth, did a um, <clears throat> study using the nationwide readmissions database um, where they looked at all the radical and all the partial nephrectomies in children's children, adolescents, and adults, and young adults. These are not all Wilms tumor. That database didn't have the ability to sort out the um, tumor type. And ultimately, they had a lot of kids in there, 3,000 radical nephrectomies, 1,300 partial nephrectomies. And they looked at complications for this group overall. Um, I'm sorry this is small, but you can see post-operative complications for the partial nephrectomies was 11% compared to 13% for radical, right? <clears throat> and then if you look at specifically nephrectomy-associated surgical complications, it's actually a little bit lower for the patients with partial nephrectomies versus radical nephrectomies. Now, they looked at length of stay, which was shorter for the partial than the radical, and they looked at cost which in their estimation was a, um, which was a sign of just how complex the post-surgical um, care was, and that was lower for partial nephrectomies, right? Oh, I did have a blow up of this, sorry. <clears throat> so, but one major problem with all of this data is that, you know, they're not matched stage for stage. Right, and while we know we know that the stages were higher for the radical nephrectomy and the partial nephrectomy in these, but there is actually no accounting for histology in any of these studies. That just wasn't none of these studies were granular enough to look at whether or not histology played a role. And we know that that's one of the biggest issues in regard to tumor prognosis. Right. So can Similar outcomes be obtained to radical nephrectomy? Maybe. I mean, it's it certainly, it, it's one of the things that we're clearly concerned about, and we'll see what the data shows. Um, but one question for what an oncologic outcome is, well, is negative margins. Is it whether or not you had increased rupture? Is it just tumor-specific survival? And unfortunately, when you look at a lot of these studies, um, the data is um, varied. So, same friend, John Ruth, he's a urologist at Duke, or pediatric urologist at Duke, um, did a quali qualitative systematic review. So they looked at 694 articles and they drilled it down to 66 articles that they included. And after reviewing these articles, they knew they could not do a meta-analysis because at the end of the day, the data was too heterogeneous. There wasn't a way to pull data from all of the studies, which would allow them to actually make a, any sort of reasonable statement. So the 91% of the studies were retrospective, 4,000 total patients included, 26% underwent nephron sparing surgery, so a quarter of the population. The, the patient populations were very dimmer, it was, were fairly different. The tumor size was clearly, size and stage were clearly higher for kids undergoing radical nephrectomy. A greater percentage of kids had chemotherapy within the nephron sparing surgery group. And this actually skews um, both with the American studies and not just because uh, partial nephrectomy is more common in the European studies. And the overall stage um, obviously was lower for nephron sparing surgery. So you're not necessarily comparing apples to apples from a cancer control standpoint. When they looked at the rupture rate, it was lower for nephron sparing surgery. The tumor recurrence rate was the same and the overall survival rate was the same. Now, when they stratified these kids over time, the kids who had surgeries in the 80s had a lot lower um, survival than the kids who had surgery more recently, which really reflects an advance in our treatment of Wilms overall. And I think the shocking thing is that 87% um, survival in nephron sparing surgery versus radical nephrectomy, 61% radical nephrectomy in the 80s, does that really mean that nephron sparing surgery was better? No, it's just that it was only given to those who had small tumors, right? But these results are encouraging, despite the fact that the tumor sizes are different, 
the Wilm stage was lower for nephron sparing surgery. They didn't stratify by histology. And more of the kids with nephron sparing surgery end up with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The other problem is if you're going to publish on your institution doing nephron sparing surgery, you're probably pretty happy with your results. There's some degree of reporting bias that goes into all of this, right? And ultimately, from an oncologic outcome standpoint, look, we show that it, it, the data shows that in a um, specific patient population, right, with smaller tumors, you know, you're you're getting pretty darn good survival for kids with Wilms, right? So there is a future role for nephron sparing surgery in the management of clearly bilateral Wilms, but is there a role for unilateral non-predisposition Wilms? Well, if it's going to play a role, you have to not just show that it's just as good from a cancer outcome standpoint. You have to prove that you're going to have functional benefits, particularly in regard to um, renal function and the eventual need for renal replacement therapy. So the risk of renal replacement therapy after unilateral nephrectomy for Wilms, it's 0.7% at 20 years. That sounds ridiculously low, less than 1% after 20 years. Now that risk goes up with bilateral Wilms, so 4%. Metacritus Wilms, it goes up even higher, right? 20%. Now that kind of makes sense because with metacritus Wilms, you probably did a radical nephrectomy at the diagnosis of the first tumor, and then you only had one kidney to work with, where if you were bilateral to begin with, like the kid we showed, you would imagine, well, you're gonna try to spare both sides, right? So there's half of a left kidney that if it was a unilateral left tumor, we would have taken the whole thing. Now, here's the thing about kids, though. If your average age of getting Wilms is three and a half, 20 years, you're at 23 and a half. You're not, it's great that only 1% of them have renal failure, but what about 20 more years after that? Because that kid should have a lot longer to go than 23 and a half years. This is a little different than doing a partial nephrectomy in a 70-year-old and saying that they're fine after 20 years, right? And these kids had normal kidney function to begin with, by and large, right? And we know that these kids with Wilms, even though they're 0.7% need for renal replacement therapy, a decent number of them have some degree of chronic kidney disease. A decent number of them have hypertension, proteinuria, some sort of issue with kidney function. Right. If we were to extrapolate some adult data and, you know, for partial nephrectomy on the adult urology side, there's a decent number of studies that demonstrate risk reduction for chronic kidney disease with partial nephrectomy versus radical nephrectomy. And you can imagine that, well, if your GFR is normal, you're over 100 and you, take a, you do a radical nephrectomy, well, that other kidney is going to compensate. You'll make up for it. But we all know that the majority of our adults are not necessarily at a GFR of 100, certainly not the majority of our 70-year-olds. So it's not unusual to do a nephrectomy and to see some degree of bump in the creatinine or decrease in GFR because they're not starting with normal kidney function. So for these adults, it's very clear that if you do partial nephrectomy, there's a decreased... Um, there's a decreased risk of chronic kidney disease, as this um, meta-analysis demonstrates. When you look at kids, you see some pretty interesting results, actually. So this is a study um, out of Denver by Nick Cost. They asked the very specific question, nephron sparing surgery, radical nephrectomy, non-syndromic unilateral Wilms. They went around the world, multiple institutions, and scoured up 15 total patients. So as we said before, because of how organized Wilms management has been, to do nephron sparing surgery on unilateral non-syndromic Wilms is incredibly rare. This is kind of a Punnett square of data. So this is the EGFR diagnosis. So actually lower for the kids with nephron sparing surgery than those with radical nephrectomy. 150 GFR is hugely normal. Their GFR post-op for the radical nephrectomy 
decrease to 131, but the GFR, which was a significant decrease, the GFR for kids with nephron sparing surgery increased to 135. I cannot explain that. And it, I can't really just, I can't really understand it based off of their data. But essentially, if you do a unil, if you're doing nephron sparing surgery, you're certainly not seeing a decrease in GFR. That's very encouraging for long-term renal function. Um, this paper came out in 2020. They um, did a meta-analysis comparing nephron sparing surgery and radical nephrectomy. They included 20 studies, including that cost study that we just looked at. And they compared um, change in GFR. This is a ratio. So the zero is no change, right? I guess it's not a ratio. It's a, yeah, it's a ratio. Because I think it's zero is no change. And then like one fold um, is, in, this is an increase, right? So the same thing, what they found was radical nephrectomy. In general, you're kind of hovering around no change. There are definitely studies that showed significant decrease. There are studies it showed some increase. But this is the zero line here for partial nephrectomy. The majority of these studies demonstrated that after you removed, after you did nephron sparing surgery, you had an increase in the GFR. Again, I don't completely understand this, but it does look like from a, it, from a functional standpoint that we potentially are preserving long-term kidney function. Now, we haven't done enough partial nephrectomies for enough time to really track these kids who are now 40 years out because there aren't that many of them in existence, right? So that's data that needs to, to be generated in the future from an adult institution because we don't see them anymore on the pediatric side. So when you think about renal outcomes, overall for Wilms, the initial nitwit psyop studies were done on, well, how do we increased treatment to improve survival. And they added chemotherapy. They changed how the surgery was done. They added lymph nodes. And they saw an improvement in success. When they reached a certain degree of success improvement, they said, wait, the later nitwit studies and the COG studies actually looked at, well, how do we reduce chemotherapy? How do we reduce radiation? How do we reduce the morbidity from these treatment goals? Well. Obviously, renal failure is one of these risks for Wilms. While it's low overall at 20 years, we know that from all comers, when you study children's cancers, they end up with cardiovascular issues. Those can lead to problems with kidney function. And if you're already behind the eight ball in regard to, to nephrons, well, you're probably at greater risk. We know that these chemotherapy cupidic agents are toxic to the kidneys. 20 years is not long for our pediatric patients. Right? The question is, what's the 50-year renal failure rate for these patients? So <clears throat> if in selected cases, nephron sparing surgery can actually decrease your renal morbidity, well, maybe we can apply this to more patients who only have unilateral disease. This um, is a little bit of a sad story. This was a kid that I saw about two years ago, two-year-old boy. Wagger, so 50% risk of Wilms. He had this little irregular cyst on a screening ultrasound, right? When we got an MRI, right? And, and you know, it's not super impressive. We waited a month, got another MRI, and you could see that this lesion has grown. We presented this at the tumor board, and what they said was, well, this is probably Wilms, 50% likelihood. It grew rapidly within a month and they gave him a six-week course of chemotherapy. This is what the kidney looked like six weeks later. So this tumor grew. We went in to do a partial and ended up doing a radical nephrectomy because by the time we cored this out over here, the hyaline was gone, right? <clears throat> now, sadly, he actually had favorable histology Wilms, which didn't exactly make sense in regard to not shrinking, because that's typically what you'd expect with anaplastic, right? This happened a couple, uh, maybe like a month ago. 
three-year-old girl, Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome, left-sided renal mass on an ultrasound. It had grown from one to one and a half centimeters over three months. Got an MRI, it was about 1.7, and we did a partial nephrectomy. Um, unfortunately, there was tumor spillage on this one, um, which upgrades her, um, but the margins were negative. So in terms of answering the question of if there's a role for nephron sparing surgery for unilateral non-syndromic Wilms tumor, I mean, a little bit of this is a, a thought process, right? Because if we can achieve survival rates that are similar for kids with predispositions undergoing nephron sparing surgery, and we can, right? Then, and we're showing that we can potentially preserve renal function, then shouldn't we re recommend partial to everyone who's amenable to it? And interestingly, SIOP, under their umbrella protocol, which includes Wilms plus non-Wilms um, renal tumors, non-Wilms renal cancers, has a protocol now for the role of nephron sparing surgery in non-syndromic unilateral Wilms. So if there's a small tumor burden, so less than 300 milliliters, there is going to be significant residual normal renal tissue left. Your lymph nodes have to be negative, right? And again, this is PSYOP, so all of these are post-chemotherapy. They've seen these shrink. By these criteria, about 3% are potentially amenable to nephron sparing surgery. But at least that's 3% that they're potentially helping from a long-term standpoint. Where should we go from here? Well. I'm not exactly sure where they came up with the 300 milliliters and these specific criteria. You can imagine a more exophytic tumor, um, tumors that aren't near the hilum, that are large, potentially can still do well with nephron sparing surgery, even if they don't meet those particular criteria. We need to overall better define the ideal treatment population for kids um, who might do well with nephron sparing surgery. We have to identify tumor characteristics, which are more amenable to surgery. And then frankly, the data out there, you know, it's nephron sparing surgery. Some people are doing hemis, some people are doing wedge resections. The urologists all kind of have an idea of what a partial nephrectomy is, but a lot of these surgeries are done being done by pediatric surgeons. Some of these tumors are being enucleated. It's a mixed bag in terms of technique. And we better, we have to standardize that better. So ultimately, if you're gonna do nephron sparing surgery, number one in your mind should still be cancer control. We have to cure it. We have to give the kid the best chance at fixing the cancer. But in a proper patient, with proper patient selection, partial nephrectomy can provide good cancer control. And there is potential for long-term benefit in renal function um, that has not been definitively proven, but the early data seems to suggest that yeah, you've got more nephrons, you're gonna do better. But ultimately, if we want to answer this right, we need some randomized controlled trials. And the question is whether or not that'll happen in COG or SIA. Questions? So, so who is your, you kind of mentioned in the talk, but just for the residents again, so who's your index patient for you would definitely do a, a partial and who's your index patient for who you would definitely not do a partial? You know, we are not necessarily, um, pushing for partials in unilateral non-syndromic Wilms. Um, patients who come in with a bilateral will get chemo and, and we will attempt partial. Any syndromic patient, we will do partial, even if it's a unilateral, we'll try a partial even if it's a unilateral tumor because the risk of recurrence on the other side is that much greater, right? Um, the solitary kidney is actually fairly rare. And my understanding is the majority of the solitary kidneys are the ones that have the contralateral taken. <laughs> right? It's not that you were born with a solitary right. kidney and you got Wilms. Yeah. Perfect. Any other questions from the residents or for the faculty? Yeah, this is Bill Catalona. Hey. Great talk. Great talk. Uh, I remember uh, when the Wilms tumor studies didn't recommend lymph node sampling, that was thought to be a, sort of an overly radical 
thing to do, but I guess it's now become incorporated into standard treatment. Uh, my question is, uh, what chemo, I mean, you know, being Christine, actinomycin D, and doxorubicin are sort of old chemotherapy agents, and we've had a lot of new drugs come along that have, you know, like never been incorporated into pediatric or at least into Wilms tumor treatment. What chemo do they use in the patients who have the anaplastic histology? You know, honestly, I do not know that off the top of my head. All right. Um, I could definitely find out for you and get you that information soon. I'm just wondering whether they use, you know, any drugs like platinum or, you know, some of these, some of the newer drugs that have come along. I, I think uh, then Christine Actomycin D are so well tolerated that by children and there's such a long history and they're so effective that maybe that's why you know, it's hard to improve on that with 90% nope. cure rate. No, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's the thing with, it's great to have these big organizations because um, it's a fairly rare disease, right? Um, pooling all these patients so that you can get real data. But the downside is obviously it's not fast. Like change is hard. And frankly, um, frankly, you know, if there's a patient that it's questionable in terms of management, we just contact the renal tumor committee at COG and we say, hey, what do you guys think of this? Can you give give us a recommendation? Right. Because you while we so if we're going to do something which is relatively cutting edge or slightly deviates, we, we, we want to run it by them to make sure they're comfortable with that. But that also slows down change, right? Because change happens because someone says, well, I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to do this. And other people say, wow, that actually worked. The downside is, man, what we do works. So it's really hard to change, right? Yeah. So. Hey, Dr. Bell, uh, it's Tarek here from uh uh, the endothermal. This quick question here. Um, it seems like all the patients undergoing partials for Wilms are um, are the ones that have the bilateral tumors, which is kind of their only option. Um, uh, so these are, are are already upstaged because they're bilateral. Um, so how do we know that they have worse outcomes because they had partials or because they were bilateral to begin with? No, you're right. We we don't. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing with this data. Right, because you're not truly comparing, you know, apples to apples. Right now, it's true that they're bilateral, so there are stage five, right? But it's not necessarily true that they're stage five, so they're um, higher cancer risk, right? Because it's still right. like if you were to isolate it to one kidney, right? That kidney is actually potentially you know that kidney the those two kidneys might have different cancer risks right Thanks. so when you look at all of this data you know it you're right it, it's hard to say that it it's hard to say that any sort of absolutes because that it's just not coordinated right but it's not coordinated because there's not a huge role for no one's studying this specifically for COG, right? Why are we doing them on bilaterals? Because it doesn't take too much thought to realize that having part of one kidney is better than having no kidneys, right? right. So that's why we're willing to do that for bilaterals, right? Thanks. Thank, thanks again, Dr. Gong. That was an excellent talk. Um, thank you, everybody, for your attention. If there's any other questions, please, please ask them. But otherwise, everyone have a good weekend. And, and um, you know, thanks again for this presentation. Great. Thank you, everyone.